We turn now to the Gospel of Luke, where we will be reading from chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And as I read these words, I invite you to listen for a good word from the Lord. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told them, this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. They say that sometimes the first step is admitting that there is a problem, particularly when it is a problem that is obvious but that we would rather ignore. So here it goes. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We are all sinners, Paul tells us. We are all sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. We are imperfect as much as we would try to be perfect. And yet we are told that we desperately need the work of Christ to bring us back into a place where we were always meant to be in perfect relationship with God before this great and terrible gift of free will seemed to take us off track. We are in the season of Lent. We are on the journey with Jesus towards Jerusalem. It is about sin and repentance. And I don't like it any more than you do. I would much rather go through those weeks of Advent leading with hope and anticipation towards Christmas. I'd rather go ahead and jump the pages on the calendar and get right to not only to Jerusalem, but to the mystery of the resurrection and the good news that comes with it of forgiveness and grace and mercy I think most of us would be much more comfortable there. And yet, as was reminded to me very recently, Jesus never calls us to be comfortable. In fact, he calls us to good news. And sometimes the good news requires that we be honest with God and even at times honest with ourselves. And as much as we'd like to go ahead and jump straight to the grace and the mercy and the love and the forgiveness, as much as we want to accept that immediately, It's not just about accepting it. In fact, it is about shaping our entire lives around the grace and mercy and forgiveness each and every day. And so this entire season is about standing in front of a mirror for self-reflection and examination. Now, I'd imagine that most of us, when we look in the mirror, our eyes are immediately drawn to those places that need fixing. The hair that is matted and graying. The stomach that is always perpetually larger than it should be. Those uh, wrinkles in the forehead that once represented an expressive personality but seem to be far more permanent than they used to be. But even beyond that, perhaps, it's not just about the physical attributes. I think most of us recognize, particularly if the mirror that we are looking into is the reflection of Jesus Christ, We recognize those places that are wanting in us, those places that need to be fixed. We recognize those places not just in our physical bodies, but even in our spirits, our personalities, our minds as well. And in some ways, it seems as though the world is always telling us there's something about us that needs to be fixed. After all, if you just look at the images of success and beauty and power that are portrayed for us in all of the media that we consume, most of us could look at us and say, yeah, we we don't measure up. And that time of self-reflection, 
that time at looking at those broken parts within us, that time of looking at the things that could be better and need to be fixed is uncomfortable. We'd much rather look at someone else and look at all the things that are going wrong with them, all the places that they need to be fixed and look at how they might embrace some sense of better then look at our own selves and be confronted with the things about us that need to be changed. I think Jesus understood this. I think he dealt with it all the time. And I think that's why when we come across his teachings, a lot of times we hear him say things about how we should not judge others because we will be judged by the same measure that we seek to judge others. He talks about not looking at the speck in someone else's eye when you've got a two-by-four in your own eye. And he says, treat others the way that you want to be treated, because let's be honest, nobody wants to be put under the microscope and dissected for all the world to see. Nobody likes that kind of vulnerability. And yet we're called to be open to the work of the Spirit. Maybe for us it's not just about judging others. Maybe we know that that's wrong, and we try to keep from doing that, as tempting as it might be. But maybe it's for us sometimes about the fact that our sin, the things that we do wrong, the ways that we go against God's ways and try to go our own ways, we'd rather think of in sort of academic terms. We'd rather keep them over there, thinking about how others might have sinned instead of looking at the way that we have. I think Jesus is looking at that same type of experience here when we get to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 13. There are some in the crowds among him, maybe it's the disciples, maybe it's just others who have mingled in and are trying to get a word from him. And they come sort of expressing to him their concern about an event that happened in Jerusalem. We're not told too much of it, but what it seems is that there were some men from Galilee who had ticked off Pilate, the governor of that region, and he decided that whatever they had done was worthy of some severe punishment. Now we don't know if maybe they were told that they needed to be killed on sight, that the soldiers were given orders, and as soon as they see them, to execute them on sight. Or, or maybe they just went to arrest them and things got out of hand. But what we are told is that at some point, the forces of Pilate went into a place where these men were offering sacrifices most likely the temple in Jerusalem itself. And they were struck down. And God describes, excuse me, Jesus describes it in very graphic terms when he talks about their blood being mixed with the blood of the sacrifices, making this place that was meant to be peaceful and a place of worship profane. They seem to be asking him, whether they ask it explicitly or if it's just Jesus recognizing what's going on in their hearts, a deeply theological question. Why did it happen? How could God allow that to happen? What did they do to deserve such a horrible death? And it is as if Jesus simply refuses to accept the premise of the question. He says it's not about that at all. Sin didn't have anything to do with that. And in fact, he points them to another incident that was purely accidental. When this tower of Siloam fell on a group of people and they all died instantly, and he said their sin had nothing to do with that either. Accidents happen. You don't need to worry about that. What you need to worry about is what's going on in your own life. Be concerned with the way that you are living your life. Be concerned with the way that you are reflecting God's desires for this world. Be concerned about your own sin, and when you see it, repent. Because if you don't, when your time comes, you will surely perish. I was reminded this week of that dark and somewhat existential Western movie from 1992 called Unforgiven, starring Clint Eastwood. Do some of you remember that movie? perhaps. Clint Eastwood plays this retired gunslinger. He was reformed by the angelic influence of his wife, and he has taken up farming in his retirement. He has two children, but farming is hard, and he is just no good at it. He hears about a woman in another town who's been murdered, and the sheriff did not do what the town wanted them to do in bringing justice, and so her friends have put a bounty on the head of the man. 
who did it. And he decides that he's going to take up one more opportunity. He calls his friend Ned. He calls upon his friend Ned, who's played by Morgan Freeman, and they set off. It's, it's a strange incident, perhaps, but they come across this guy named the Schofield Kid, and, and, and he seems to be cocky, and he talks a big game, but it's very clear he doesn't have the experience he claims to have. They get into a fight, and he strikes down another man, and the kid is literally shaking in his boots, and he's trying to justify what has just happened to himself, and he said, well, I guess he had it coming. And in this profound existential moment, Bill Money, the Clint Eastwood character, says, we all got it coming, kid. We don't like to think about it, but life is fragile. We have no idea how long we will be on this earth. Our days are numbered, and we have no idea when our number will be up, or even the manner in which it will be called up. But there will come a time when we will have to stand before the God who created us. And we will have to lay bare an account of what we have done in this life. We will have to lay bare an account of the way that we have used this life and whether or not it has reflected the image of Christ that God desires us to or if it's reflected something else. New Testament scholar Alan Culpepper says that We have no way of protecting ourselves and those we love from every single danger in this world. Whether it be a car accident, a disease, emotional distress of one form or another, or random acts of violence. But the good news in this passage, he says, is that Jesus seems to say that God does not have anything to do with causing those calamities. Instead, what Jesus wants to remember is that at any moment, any one of us could stand before our maker. And so Jesus wants to say our focus needs to be in how we are living with the knowledge that we have such little time on this earth. But also to know that because we recognize what happened not only on the cross in Jerusalem, but because we know what happened with the empty tomb, that there is always hope for us. There is always another opportunity to start again. There is always another opportunity to allow God's Spirit to work in us and through us to shape us into the people that God desires us to be. So Jesus tells the story of a fig tree about a man who owns some land and there's a fig tree on it that is simply not producing the fruit that it needs to. And Jesus says that the man wants to make the most of that. He wants it to be as productive as it can, to bring in as much money as it can. And when he realizes he's got this tree that is doing no good, he tells the gardener, just cut it down and throw it away and plant something new there. But the gardener loves the tree. Even as it sits there, perhaps withered and not producing, he knows that it's got potential for good. And so he says, just give me one more year. Let me work with it. Let me nourish it. Let me fertilize it. Let me make sure it has everything that it needs to produce. But if it doesn't, then at the end of that year, you can cut it down. When I first came to work here at Augusta Road Baptist Church, Leah was redecorating my office. Not only did the furniture need to be arranged, and there needed to be curtains hung up on the the walls, but she thought that it was important that I have a plant in my office. I think that's supposed to be good for our health. It adds some ambiance. It'd be easier for people to feel comfortable as they came in and sat down for counseling or meeting or whatever it may be. And so she decided that she was going to buy me a fiddle leaf fig tree and a beautiful pot to go with it. What we quickly found out is that fiddle leaf figs are some of the most fragile plants you might ever come across. And in fact, just transporting them from one place to another can do irreparable harm. They need the perfect amount of sunlight. They need the perfect amount of water. They need to be sure they're in an optimal temperature in order for them to thrive. Well, we put it in a corner of my office that did not have the optimal amount of sunlight. I had a tendency to overwater it. 
I have an office that has two exterior walls with big sets of windows, and the insulation is, well, let's just say not phenomenal in that area of the, the church. And so if, if it's hot outside and hot in everybody else's office, it's as least, at least as hot in my office. If it's cold outside and in everybody's office, it's at least as cold in my office. And so I would walk into my office every morning, and there would be one, two, three, four fiddle leaf fig leaves just lying on the floor. Or I'd be working diligently, studying for a sermon, and all of a sudden I would hear another one as it floated down and hit the floor. And so I quickly gave up on the thing. There's no hope for it. I'm throwing it away, and I did. It was not a good experience with plants. And so I was somewhat wary, given that experience, when Leah told me that her sister had given her a fiddle leaf fig as a housewarming present when we moved back into our house after the renovations were completed. I don't know where it came from, but the transportation was not good to it. And quickly the leaves started to brown. I knew what must have been coming. There's no reason to keep working on it. It's dead and dying. Just throw it away. But not Leah. No. She quickly got on the internet and Googled fiddle leaf figs. As, and she went through every reputable source she could find that would help her to understand how to care for it and nurture it back into health. She moved its placement in the house so it would have more sunlight. She made sure to ration its water. She even got a meter that will measure the moisture in the soil so that she would know when to give it more water or when it's got too much. And she even went on Facebook and found a Facebook uh, group for fiddle leaf fig parents who were all trying to bring their fiddle leaf figs back to health. You should have heard the celebration that took place when the first green sprout came from its trunk to say that there was rejoicing in the king household on that day is certainly an understatement but it's starting to thrive because it had exactly what it needed particularly the care I think what Jesus is trying to say is that God wants to care for us just like that. That God wants to make sure we have everything that we need. And in fact, everything that we need is available to us if the soil of our souls just gets tilled and opened enough to it. But there are often things that get in the way. Now, I'm not talking about those random accidents. I'm not talking about those acts of violence and trauma that someone else does to us. Those things have a tendency to take root and get in the way as well. But God had nothing to do with those. I'm talking about those things that we allow to creep in and take over when we try to go our own way instead of God's. Spiritually, we call those sins. Literally, it's an archery term that means that we missed the mark of the target that God had set for us. They come in so many different forms. They come when we try to put something before God. They come in our sense of anger and hatred towards others. They come when we lust after anything and anyone with whom we are not in a deep God-rooted covenant. Mostly, they just come when we try to do things our way instead of God's. And this season of Lent, this passage, in fact, is Jesus trying to tell us we have a choice in the matter. We have a choice to open ourselves up to the healing work of God and to choose to reflect God's ways again. Scholar Ronald J. Allen says that for the writer who wrote both the book of Luke and the book of Acts, to repent is to turn away from the attitudes and attributes of this world and reflect the values and aspirations of God's realm. I bring back Alan Culpepper who said that the lesson of the fig tree is to help us recognize that this life each day that we are given is a gift. And we're supposed to live as if it is a gift to be cherished and nurtured so that at some point when our time is up we can stand before our creator and he can see that we 
have taken this treasure that has been given to us. And we have lived in a worthy fashion. We know where this journey is headed. It's headed towards the cross. That moment that was not only necessary for us to receive forgiveness and reconciliation to God, but it's also that moment where Jesus identifies most clearly with every single possible pain we could ever experience. And he wants to say to us, I see you. I see what you're going through. And I love you enough even to go to this distance to make sure that it can be all brought back together. And so when we see things like New Zealand and Sandy Hook and Charleston and Parkland, It's not for us to necessarily look and ask, why did it happen? Although that is natural for us. It's not for us to look and to assign blame, even. It's for us to look inward. To look at ourselves. And to say, what have we done that might have allowed this to happen? What can we do now in this moment to reflect the love of the Christ who hung on the cross so that we would know that Jesus stands with the suffering and those who have been hurt in a way that says the ground is still being tilled even though there are things within it that would stand in the way of it thriving. That there is still an opportunity to be worked within us to more clearly reflect the image of God to the world. Dr. Benjamin Elijah, who's the president of Morehouse College, has often said that our job is to take the first step and let God do the rest. And maybe when we come to any moment of self-reflection, whatever it may be, whether we see it in the news or we brought to it in a liturgical season or if it's something that has happened in our life and we are called to ask what God can do through it, perhaps we should take that first step and open ourselves and admit that things could be better within us and let God do the rest. Perhaps this season of Lent can be another moment like that for us. Another moment in which we can come back to the cross. Another moment in which we can open ourselves and allow God's tilling work to continue to tend the garden of our souls. May we be open to that moment.